I want to transition now away from Hull's work to talking about the work of, of Philip Kitcher, uh, uh, who's, who's going to build on some of the ideas that we talked about before, in particular the work of Emir Lakatos and Larry Loudon. Lakatos and Loudon were focused on this idea of competition between research programs uh, in Lakatos's term or research traditions in Loudon's terms. And, and, and they tried to sort of spell out uh, uh, how progress worked by uh, th this, this competition, by this back and forth uh, between various different programs and traditions. But Kitcher noticed that they lacked, uh, 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 that Lakatos and Loudon didn't really uh, ask about, about how it is that the distribution of labor should pan out for science as a whole. Uh, again, you only have so many scientists out there, so many lab workers, so many labs. Uh, uh, and so there's, there has to, if, if different traditions or programs are competing with one another, how is it that we, uh, we should organize science in such a way that we distribute our labor in the way that will lead to the, to the, to the most progress? So to, to sort of imagine this, just try to imagine you have two research programs. I'm going to use an example that I mentioned just a little earlier in the lecture. Think about the idea of cold fusion versus hot fusion. Uh, right now, they're, they're, they are building a reactor in France. It's supposed to go online in 2025 uh, that, you know, if it works, will basically create a small sun inside of it. Uh, and and you, you, that will allow us to, you know, again, assuming it works, to, uh, to, to create a tremendous amount of energy uh, in, in ways that we have not been able to do, in ways, ways in which really is all, you only find in the heart of stars. Uh, now, this, we're not really sure whether or not these, this, this sort of hot fusion reactor is going to work out, um, but right now it's a pretty promising program. People are spending literally billions of dollars trying to get this reactor online, and a lot of scientists are pouring into that research program to see if they can get that to work. On the other hand, cold fusion is technically still around. It's just really, really unpopular. There are a few people who try to do research into cold fusion, um, but these people are sort of seen as kind of quixotic. They're tilting at windmills, and the community as a whole is pretty sure that cold fusion is never going to pay off. So you have here X. Hot fusion, in my example, that looks like it's much more promising. It gets more uh, more money. It gets more attention. Um, uh, but technically speaking, I don't think anyone would say that it, that it's impossible for cold fusion to work. We don't really see a viable way forward with it now. But you know, oftentimes you, you know, science works slowly, and you know, without some scientists trying to do some work on cold fusion, uh, obviously it's never going to get there. But maybe if some people uh, uh, put in hard effort, uh, maybe in a few centuries, decades, or even centuries, cold fusion will. Act actually work out. Now, um, uh, let's imagine, for the sake of argument, that only one of these two could pan out. Uh, that's technically not true for my example. Hypothetically, both of them could work. Um, but for the sake of argument, let's just imagine uh, uh, that, that these two uh, uh, research programs are, are, are mutually exclusive. One works out or the other works out, but not both. So the question then becomes, from a social structure point of view, how should we allocate our resources? You know, uh, principally here, I'm thinking about how many really researchers we should spend on each of these two research programs in order to maximize our chances of success. Now, one thing we could do, of course, is just put all our eggs in one basket. We, we put all our scientists working on just one research program. But that would pretty clearly be a stupid idea because, uh, you know, b b b with the very nature of uncertainty, we don't know for sure which of these two programs is going to work out. So the, 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 the more rational strategy is to hedge our bets somewhat, distribute some researchers into, into research program one and another set of researchers into a different research program. But how exactly should we do this? How should we strike this balance? Kitcher proposes a couple of different ways of thinking about this. So the first is what he calls a top-down strategy. Uh, 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 he, this is sort of a, a basic language in game, th in game theory, a way of trying to sort of uh, to, to think through different strategic moves in order to, uh, uh, to, to, to maximize the best outcomes, to win the game, as it were. So, so this, this first strategy, the top-down strategy, says let's imagine that we just have like a dictator of science. We're just one guy who has all the control about who's going to work on what. Uh, obviously, it doesn't work this way, but just for the sake of illustration, just, just play it out and, and, and see where it goes. So you're the dictator of science, and you get to decide how many researchers you put on Project 1 and how many researchers you put on Project 2. Now, now, the more people working on a given option, it's going to increase the odds of success. Uh, uh, obviously, it's not the only factor, um, uh, but all other things being equal, if you put more researchers working on a particular problem, you're going to increase the chances of them, of, of them working, uh, making that particular program succeed. 
But also, of course, there is a diminishing margin of, of return factor going on here. Uh, uh, at a certain point, you can add another 10 or another 100 scientists, but they're going to be able to do very, very little because the field is already sort of saturated at the moment. Uh, uh, and all they can do is just sort of backstop other people and, and, and keep replicating work that's already been done. It's not exactly novel work that's going to be advancing things forward. So, uh, again, you're the dictator of science, of science and you start uh, allocating your workers and, and, and you add, let's say, 100 scientists to research program X. And then you keep adding more scientists uh, to, to research program X until it gets to the point where you think uh, that you've increased the odds of succeeding uh, 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 overall um, uh, 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 until you, you sort of hit that saturation point. And then you start redistributing the, uh, uh, the, the remaining scientists to research program Y. Uh, uh, so you're, you're, you're trying to make the smartest bets you can here as the dictator of science. Now, obvious problem with the strategy, of course, is that's not the way it works. Some people do allocate funding, and, and, and allocating funding, of course, uh, like the United States government uh, contributes in a tremendously large amount of money to scientific research. Um, so th that's probably the closest you can come to this sort of top-down strategy. Uh, but even with that, there's so many other players in the field, so many other sources of funding, uh, so many other just intrepid scientists who are willing to, to, to scramble on their own. Uh, and they're not going to take orders from anybody. Um, that this kind of top-down strategy model is, is interesting sort of thought experiment, but it's obviously not the way it works. So the way it actually works in the real world is closer to a bottom-up strategy. You have no scientific dictator that can just tell people, uh, tell every single person in the scientific community what they want to research. So instead, what, what we want to do, according to Kitcher, is find a way to structure the reward system in science that will incentivize individual scientists to produce something close to that ideal distribution that we saw from the top-down strategy. Uh, uh, if we can organize the various incentives in such a way uh, uh, that will create sort of the most rational, optimal outcome of getting the, the highest bang for our buck, uh, then that will be an effectively well-organized scientific community. Now, one thing which we wouldn't want to do, according to Kitcher, is just give a fixed salary. And by salary there, I don't mean money. I mean a, a fixed amount of, of recognition, a fixed amount of credit for, for anyone who just happens to be working in whatever program ends up being the vindicated one. Um, the, what, the re, and the reason why for that should be pretty clear, it sort of leads to an all our eggs in one basket form of distribution, right? Uh, uh, every individual scientist would simply head for the one that they thought was the most likely to win because that's where they're going to get the only place that they're going to get any payoff. Everyone's going to flock to, in my example again, hot fusion and no one would research cold fusion. Uh, so uh, what Kitcher says is the solution to this problem is to, is to create a particular sort of social structure that works a little bit like this. First off, you divide the pie evenly between everyone who worked on the, ind uh, on the vindicated theory. So, so you start off with sort of, a, 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 of an even uh, uh, distribution of power. But as new, uh, as new scientists are coming into the fold, they're going to see that certain areas are particularly crowded and other areas are particularly wide open. So again, go back to my illustration. If a young physicist or a young electrochemist it sees that there's already you know, 3,000, 4,000 people working in hot fusion and realizes that, that, that uh, they're not going to be able to really make a contribution in that area, but there's only maybe a dozen scientists currently working on cold fusion, they might decide to, to, to go for cold fusion instead. Not because they necessarily think it's more likely to succeed, not because they're a true believer in cold fusion, um, but simply because they understand that, you know, this is the field that they want to work in, and the one research program is already overcrowded. So it just sort of makes sense from a sort of rational return point of view that the way that their best bet for getting a huge share, a huge chunk of recognition, is if they they they, they, they put their money on the long bet and they, they try a, a unlikely but uh, uh, nonetheless, at least in principle, possible research program. So even if cold fusion is less likely to succeed than hot fusion, it might be rational for individual scientists to, 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 to start investigating that more simply because it allows them for a higher expected return. Now, there's an obvious problem with this, which is pointed out by the philosopher Michael Strevens, and this is a criticism of, of Kitcher's optimal solution here. Uh, Strevens pointed out that for, for some particular competing research programs, it will be rational for people to join even though they are well aware that they will not be able to contribute to the likelihood of success. So think here about just, just not particularly good scientists. You know, good enough to get a PhD, good enough to, to maybe get a position, but not good enough to actually make any real contribution. And they recognize this. 
Um, but because they want to be on the winning team, uh, they're going to do everything they can in their power to, 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 to work their way into the winning team. This is an old problem in game theory and in political philosophy. It's called the free rider problem, right? People w want to sort of uh, ride on the coattails of other people who are actually doing the work so they can reap the benefits without actually making a contribution. This is a real problem in a variety of social, uh, social situations, and Strevens recognizes that it can be a problem in, in science as well. So to avoid this problem, Strevens makes an alternate suggestion, a different way uh, uh, of, of divvying up our, our credit allocation than the one that Kitcher uh, uh, suggested in, uh, in, in, in the previous slide. Strevin says we should divvy up the pie in proportion to the contribution that each individual scientist makes to the program's success. Uh, um, and this is, a this is a sort of a proposal, but Strevens actually thinks this is how we, what we actually see in science. One of the things that you will note, it, 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 it's kind of a petty thing in some ways, but it, it, for scientists it really matters. The order in which the names of the authors on scientific articles are published really makes a difference. The first named author is the person who is considered to have done most of the work. Now, some journals and some groups are trying to eschew this practice. They, they, they say we should just list everyone in alphabetical order, so everyone is sort of share, so the credit is shared evenly. Um, but I think that's still a minority uh, a practice. The majority of journals still expect people to organize the, the names of the authors in a way that creates a kind of pecking order. This is the person who did the most work, and then the second person did the second most work. And, you know, some scientific articles will have dozens of different authors, and, you know, by the the time you get to the last couple of authors, they're barely getting any credit at all. Uh, so so th this sort of structure of trying to sort of track contribution and giving people uh, esteem and credit based on the contribution that they make to a particular article or a particular field ha seems to have some, 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 some general uh, uh, traction in the actual practices of science as we understand it. And Peter Godfrey Smith seems to sort of agree with this. Uh, uh, he, he, he echoes this in his book, Theory and Reality, which again is the principal text that I'm using to structure these lectures. Now, I want to uh, editorialize here a little bit because I think this actually is a mistake. I think Strevens is, is drastically idealizing the practice of science, and, it, and he does so because he's losing sight of a lot of the important insights that, uh, that Thomas Kuhn uh, drew our attention to. It's too easy to sort of treat science as though it is this sort of intellectually perfect enterprise uh, that can't be corrupted in a variety of ways. Far too often, it's incredibly difficult to accurately assess who is actually contributing what to a particular scientific program. There are so many non-epistemic, non-scientific factors that can distort this picture. There's political concerns, there's personal dispositions, there's economic factors, and there's institutional factors. And all of these things can obscure a clear attempt to give credit where it's due. It, it doesn't have to necessarily be because scientists aren't trying to give credit where it's due. It's just that there's so many other factors out there that it creates noise. So consider a couple of quick examples right here. First off, in the, in the uh, lecture on feminism, I mentioned how James Watson quite deliberately snubbed Rosalind Franklin's contribution to the discovery of the double helix structure of DNA. Franklin made absolutely essential work in X-ray crystallography, and without her work, uh, Watson and Crick never would have been able to succeed. Uh, um, unfortunately, Franklin died before the uh, Nobel Prize for this discovery was was merited out. But a lot of people think that had she had she lived a little bit longer, she would have shared the, the Nobel Prize with Watson and Crick. But James Watson himself deliberately downplayed her credit. In his book, The Double Helix, he said all kinds of terrible, sexist things about Rosalind Franklin and all, basically never acknowledged the important scientific work that she did. So there's an example of how institutionalized and personalized sexism can uh, throw credit off. So, so even though Franklin is today sort of gradually starting to get more recognition and get more of the credit that she's actually due. Uh, uh, this is, it's, it's long overdue, and her name still is nowhere near as famous or popular as Watson and Crick, even though I think you can easily make the case that her contribution was as important as anything that, that Watson and Crick actually did in this discovery. Another example of this uh, comes from, from, from uh, the personal feud between Isaac Newton and Robert Hooke. Uh, uh, Newton and Hooke were contemporaries, and they bitterly hated each other. Uh, they, they had all kinds of personal disagreements, uh, and Robert Hooke uh, died before Newton. And after Hooke died, Newton became the president of the Royal Society of London, and he used his position of power to basically bury 
all of Robert Hooke's contributions to science. Uh, he, he deliberately uh, uh, would, would channel a, lo a lot of credit for Hooke's ideas to other scientists. He would downplay the contributions that, uh, that Hooke made in, in where he couldn't downplay them. According to the legend, at least, he, he even destroyed the only portrait of Robert Hooke that was actually painted in his lifetime. The, the, the picture that I'm showing you here was painted after his death. Um, that appears to be how, how bitter and how petty Isaac Newton was uh, when it came to Robert Hooke. Now, in, in Newton's defense, Robert Hooke was kind of a, a real jerk to Newton as well. It's not like this acrimony was only a one-way street. But again, the, the point here is just to show that scientists are human too, and they can have these sort of personal rivalries and these personal, personal feuds, which can then make it very difficult for people to accurately understand uh, exactly how much credit is due. It really isn't until the 20th century that historians took a closer look back and, and realized how important a lot of Robert Hooke's work was. He did crucial work in microscopy, for example. He, he uh, seriously improved early microscopes. Uh, and for like 200 years or so, no one really recognized Hooke or gave him appropriate credit because Newton had buried him. It's also worth noting here really quickly that, that, that uh, when his body was interned, when Robert Hooke's body was disinterred so they could relocate it and bury it in a different place in the early 19th century, I think it was, uh, his body wasn't there. So no one actually knows where Robert Hooke's body is. Now, I don't think there's any evidence that suggests that Isaac Newton had anything to do with this, but... I almost got to speculate, I almost got to wonder, because that is the kind of shit that Isaac Newton would do uh, in order just to throw some shade on his rival, Robert Hooke. So it's an ugly story, an ugly element in the history of science, but it, it, it shows how difficult it can be, precisely because human beings are only human, uh, to accurately track and credit the, uh, the appropriate work. I mentioned, for example, the point about the ordering of the authors. Almost always, the first author is whoever is, is the head of the lab that the research is done at. But very frequently, that person won't actually make any particular contribution to a particular paper or a particular program. Their name is at the top because it's their lab. Uh, you know, they, they might have been like a backstop. They might have, have, have uh, given some ideas. But oftentimes, it's the students, the grad students, the lab techs that do not only the legwork, but that actually do the majority of the, of the, of the conceptual work. They might come up with the experiment themselves. Uh, uh, they might actually execute the experiment themselves. But because they're working in such and such person's lab, his or her name goes on the, the, the first name on that paper. So it's not at all clear that that kind of uh, 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 order of publication uh, 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 name, um, names and publications actually accurately reflects credit in a way that, that Strevens thinks that it, sh it would or that it should. So all told, this kind of social structure, what it incentivizes is not actually contributing to society, to, to scientific work, but a rather savvy politicking. Who can kiss up the most? Who can flatter the head of the, uh, of the, the laboratory the most? Who can get them to pay the most attention to their ideas? Not because they're the best, but because you know, the person just knows how to work the system. Uh, there's, an, there's a great quote here from the, the naturalist and philosopher Alexander von Humboldt uh, that I think really captures this notion. According to Humboldt, quote, there are three stages of scientific discovery. First, people deny that it's true. Then they deny that it's important. Finally, they credit the wrong person. Uh, now, Maybe this quote actually didn't come from Humboldt. Wouldn't that be an irony, right? If, if this is a misattributed quote. But whoever said this sentiment, uh, the sentiment, I think, carries a lot of weight. Uh, uh, in, in, in science, it's not always easy to figure out exactly who uh, deserves the credit. So we've seen a couple of different approaches here to looking at how the social structure of science uh, is organized in a way that it incentivizes scientists to work. Whatever the actual social structure is, and again, this, this is a difficult thing to do. It's not just as simple as uh, going out there. There's a reason why sociologists and, 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 and social psychologists and philosophers are still trying to sort of understand these problems. Uh, whatever its actual social structure is, it, it, it still does seem to be one of the, the best ways that we have to, to funneling people to focus and work on real problems in the world. Science is very clearly a cumulative and coordinated strategy for answering questions. And while it is certainly not flawless, it certainly has these kinds of problems. I don't want anyone to, take, to get the wrong takeaway to think that we should have some sort of whole scale skepticism about science or about the idea of credit.
it's difficult to strike this balance between cooperation and competition. Uh, uh, it, it, in fact, in the real world, it probably doesn't strike this perfect balance uh, all the time. It probably often leans to one way or another. Um, but that sort of just goes to show how it is that there are other alternatives. There's other ways in which we can organize these various social forces to tip the balance in one way or the other. And, that, and tipping that balance might improve the overall outcome that we find in society. We might get better science if we restructure structure some of these incentives, like, for example, just doing alphabetical order uh, on the author list on scientific papers rather than attempting to list um, based on, uh, on, on the perceived amount of contribution to the paper. Um, maybe that kind of share and share alike cooperative attitude uh, would work better than something that's more competitive like the way that Kitcher and Strevens are talking about. This is a sentiment, actually, that several feminist philosophers of science have argued for, uh, that they think that if we shift more towards a cooperative model rather than a competitive model, uh, if, we, if people get their egos out of it, if they stop worrying about getting particular recognition and credit and use and instead just try to contribute as much as they can, try to work well with others, um, this might, for example, cut down on things like academic fraud uh, or, or, or sabotaging. I, I have, you know, I went to grad school with a lot of uh, science students and, and several of them told me stories about how Various people in their labs would sometimes sabotage their research because there is a there's a pretty cutthroat competition in some fields. And uh, uh, there, it might be the case that really good scientific research is getting cut short precisely because uh, this kind of competitiveness uh, uh, incentivizes people to sabotage work or to downplay work or, or ignore important work uh, that might threaten uh, the, the prestige of, of other people. Uh, now. Case studies for and against this view and for and against these other views that Kitcher and Strevens are talking about can obviously be mustered to support either side. Uh, science is big and the, its history is long. Uh, and if you go out looking to cherry pick particular examples, kind of like I've been doing with several of these examples that I've been, uh, been bringing up here, you can show this pattern actually exists. But these small sort of anecdotal stories don't necessarily tell us what the big picture looks like. And it's, it's really hard to get a grasp on that big picture, precisely because science is so variegated, its history is so long, there's so many different people, so many different projects, so many different programs, so many different labs, uh, that there might not be a clear one-size-fits-all solution or theory that tells us how these things are social or organized socially. Okay, I want to close by putting one more consideration into the pot here when talking about social structure, and it's something that I've largely been shoving off to the side heretofore, and that is the role of money in science. Now, again, since, at least since Thomas Kuhn, we've, uh, philosophers and historians and sociologists have always been aware that money plays a role in science. Uh, if a scientist has to decide between two research programs, one he can get funding for and one that he can't get funding for, there's a pretty good chance uh, he's going to pick the one that he can get funding for. Uh, so so it, it, I've never tried to be naive about the idea that money has a controlling role in science. But I've also sort of been saying that it isn't the principal motivation or the principal thing that, that scientists go for. Uh, but even if that's true, it, it, it doesn't uh, mean that the small number of people who are profoundly influenced by money can't put their fingers on the scales and distort the scientific community and, and, and scientific outcomes more generally speaking. So every scientist has to consider where their funding is coming from, but some are more mercenary than others. Probably one of the most obvious examples of this would be the quote-unquote controversy, the scientific controversy over the relationship between cancer and cigarettes. Now, today, this is a settled question. There is no scientific dis d dispute here. Cigarettes are a leading contributor to, to increased rates of things like lung cancer, emphysema, um, uh, uh, stroke. Uh, cigarettes are really, really bad for you, and everyone in the scientific community recognizes this. But if you go back to like the Mad Men days in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, uh, there were real legitimate scientists, professional scientists, respected scientists, who were doing work often work funded by the tobacco industry that produced results that said that cigarettes didn't cause cancer, that there wasn't a health risk. Uh, there was even a time a little earlier than that, in I think the 30s and 40s, in which uh, several physicians were recommending uh, cigarettes uh, as, as something that had curative properties. Uh, so, uh, in retrospect, this is a pretty dark hour in the history of science, uh, but at the time, uh, even scientifically literate people might have been legitimately confused about what the best scientific information says. Was there actually a link or not? Um, 
to a certain extent today, you see this going on with global warming uh, uh, denialism. Uh, there are a small handful of scientists, it's something like one out of a hundred or something like that, uh, that do legitimate work and that claim that global warming isn't really happening or it's not happening in the way that other scientists say they were. But the clear consensus is pretty overwhelming that global warming is real. It's a real threat. Human beings are causing it, etc. and so forth. But even just a small number of legitimate scientists can provide cover for people with a political incentive to try and deny this. They can point to this one out of 100 legitimate scientists who publishes a paper in a legitimate journal that says that you know, anthropogenic climate change isn't really happening or isn't happening so fast or it's not going to be so bad. Uh, and that can create the illusion, in the general public's mind at least, that there is a scientific controversy here. Even though a sober assessment of the literature makes it very clear that there is no controversy, there is a, a basically a unanimous agreement here in the scientific literature, um, uh, the overall picture can be easily distorted when money starts flowing in. Now, in the early part of the 21st century where we are today, there's been a marriage of industry and science, which is starting to take this basic complication to greater and greater heights. These days, an awful lot of scientific funding is coming from groups that have a profit motive involved. Computer science would be the obvious example here. You know, uh, uh, companies like Google and Microsoft and Apple are pouring tons and tons of money into universities like Stanford in order to fund research and to fund students working in computer science. But they're not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're not doing this because they want to understand the nature of reality or the, or the nature of nature better or anything like that, but rather because they expect to be able to reap benefits from this. Universities are receiving more and more funding than businesses than e from, from businesses than ever before. Genetic engineering is another example of this, where, where there's a tremendous amount of money coming in from biotech firms into to universities, uh, and they are and that money is distorting the nature of the research. Another example of this would be in geology. A tremendous amount of uh, research money in geology comes from the hydrocarbon industry, from oil and gas. Uh, so a, a, a research that, uh, in geology that doesn't contribute in some way to the bottom line of the oil and gas industry is far less likely to get funded than research that does. Uh, another example, this is the testing of drugs. Uh, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of the research uh, by, uh, that is funded by Big Pharma is, is spent not on the drugs that cause the most harm or the most damage, but on the drugs that are the most profitable. Uh, drugs for things like erectile dysfunction are a lot more likely to make money than drugs for serious but relatively uncommon conditions that, that cause serious pain and discomfort in a small number of people are. Um, so uh, the patenting of designer genes is another example of this. Again, genetic engineering, there's all sorts of legal and moral problems that come up in this context, which I don't have time to get into now, but you can use your imagination here. So with everything we've been talking about with regard to how the social structure of science is worked, I think it's worth considering as to whether or not money might be fundamentally transforming the nature of how scientific work is engaged. If it hasn't done it yet, the, you know, these, these examples that I'm giving here early are just you know, a tip of the iceberg. They're just a start. Um, uh, but if, if the, our sort of economic systems keep heading in the direction that they are, and if scientific research continues to become more and more expensive, it's not hard to imagine that by the end of this century, the relationship between scientists and the scientific community and the social structure that incentivizes them and organizes them might look radically different than it does today. And it's not at all clear that this will be for the better.